Hey everyone, and welcome to today's uh, workshop. Uh, I have Sherelle Narman here, Arrow's Head of Customer Success. We're hoping to be joined by uh, Mike Adams from Grain. He's having some technical difficulties, but we are hoping to get those resolved and, and up and running uh, so that we can keep going with exactly what we had, had planned for you all today. Uh, but before we get into it, we're just going to kick this off and, and sort of roll with things. Um, so if you want to say hi in the chat, uh, let us know where you're, you're joining us from. Let us know if there's anything in particular that you, you want to hear. We have um, some, things, some things planned, but uh, we want to make sure that we make this as valuable and as helpful for you all as possible. So if there's anything that you are particularly interested in, any uh, specific ways that you're currently using uh, call recordings or thinking about, using core recordings to customer success, then let us know. Uh, it looks like Mike maybe is back with us. So I'm going to bring him in here. Hey, Mike. Uh, Microsoft Word decided to uh, install itself two minutes before this <laughs> started. So I had to restart my entire computer and force quit. Sorry about that. Of course. No worries. Um, cool. Well, uh, Web-based applications. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to kick things off here and then sort of get out of the way and let Mike and Sherelle really run the show here today. So I'm going to go through a really quick uh, sort of agenda of what we're going to uh, get into and cover today. Uh, first off, uh, I'm Stuart Balcom. Uh, I run growth at Arrows. And today we're going to get into uh, some really quick intros, but then really into the topic itself of how to leverage call cool recordings for customer success. We're going to talk a little bit about the challenges of sharing uh, customer insights and what to do maybe if you're not recording calls or if you're recording calls but not necessarily using them as effectively as you would like. We're going to get into some solutions, um, what you can do to make those call recordings uh, more high leverage and more useful across your teams. Uh, we use uh, call recordings and uh, Grain specifically to do that at Arrows. So we're going to get into a little bit of a case study and talk about sort of some of the things that we found work well at Arrows. Uh, and then sort of a, a tactical water, how you can apply some of those things yourself um, along with any questions as well. One thing that I do want to call out uh, is that we have templates that will be available for sort of how to do uh, and go and implement all the things that we're gonna show you in this workshop in the Arrows Vault. Um, so if you uh, head over to arrows.to slash vault or arrows.to slash templates, and search for grain, you'll find these three uh, templates there that you can go ahead and steal and, and use yourself. Uh, we'll get into those in the workshop itself, uh, but you can also make use of those for yourself. So I wanted to, uh, as I mentioned, I wanna get out of the way and, and let these guys uh, really run the show here. Um, so I wanna introduce uh, hosts or guests to today. Uh, first off, we have Mike Adams, who is the CEO and founder of Grain, who, uh, Grain, if you don't know, I'm sure Mike will give the, the better elevator pitch uh, than me, but Grain is a call cool recording tool. And of course, uh, Mike has a ton of experience with the challenges and the sort of solutions that we're going to get into today. Thanks so much for joining us, Mike. Awesome. Yeah. It's great to be here. And second, we have Sherelle Nariman, who runs customer success at Arrows. Sherelle has a ton of experience at companies like Sprout Social and Booking.com. Uh, and of course, is going to be talking a little bit about how we use uh, call cool recordings and, and really use them to stay close to customers at Arrows. But as we get into this, if you have any questions, if you have anything, as I mentioned, that you particularly want to see covered, then let us know in the chat. I'll be sure to stay in there and keep on top of, of those things. We'll have time for questions as well at the end, but let's get into the, the topics. Uh, Mike, as you're joining us, you know, subject matter expert in all things, uh, cool recording, I'm sure you see a lot at Grain. Like, why is this such an important topic? Like, why are we even here talking about uh, recording calls and sort of specifically with the purpose of being able to use those calls uh, for making customers successful? Because they're data and data powers change in human behavior and technology and uh, large language models really arrived six months ago and have completely changed what we can do with the data. Um, and I think that, you know, 
grain was early on that kind of recognition of the thesis of just as it was crazy for emails to disappear after they were sent <laughs> and not be like saved and searchable or Uh oh, <laughs> um, Sherelle, let's keep uh, keep going. I guess maybe from your perspective, uh, Sherelle, what it's I guess same question. Um, why why are call recordings? I know you record uh, pretty much every call that you have at at hours with customers. We also record them uh, internally. But why why is it so important to do that sort of from the from the start? Like why? What happens if you have you been in worlds where you aren't recording calls, or like what's the what's the downside of uh, of not having call recordings? Yeah, what um, Mike was starting to get to, I think, before before some of the cutting out there was ultimately they are all data points, right? And we care so much about data and all other aspects of business when we're measuring metrics and KPIs and obviously the highest level numbers and revenue and retention in most worlds the voice of the customer is also individual data points if you get product feedback one time or you have a thought that's a data point now if 10 people say it and now you know how they said it and how they asked for it and what those applications actually were those are all those data points that mike was starting to allude to that help you actually make better informed decisions on what your customers are actually saying and actually doing um to your point of when to start or how to start or why to start. I mean, in, in my world, all I do is talk to customers all day long, myself, my teams, whether it's onboarding or support or customer success or renewal, like all of those are individual moments where I am, if I'm doing my job correctly, learning from customers and hearing what it is they're saying. And then I get to play the conduit between that voice and all the rest of the teams and the development teams and the product teams and the marketing teams and the sales teams, right? Um, and as great as my memory is, I can't remember eight calls a day times five days a week times endless days a year, right? And so actually having those bits recorded not only makes me more confident in my job and my ability to turn around and also act as a product manager and share some of that information, but actually share the voice, but it also makes my customers feel really special. And I've heard literal customers tell me, how do you remember all of our data needs or all of our reporting needs? Or how do you know this little bit of our business? And I pride myself in knowing my customers and I have the upper hand of being able to go listen to those recordings and actually hear the next steps and actually hear the things that were discussed. Um, so all of it is data, but it's data that I think is live and dynamic and lets you really learn from customers and then turn around and help serve them. Um, and what that looks like in the real world, I get to pick up the phone when I talk to someone and say, hey, hey, Mike, remember you asked for this three weeks ago? Well, we're building that thing or I have an extra question on it. Can you go a layer deeper for me? And then I get to just turn around and reshare that. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but Grain has made that specifically easy for me because of some of the AI notes that come with it now and some of the generated highlights that come out of there and summaries. And it physically has made my job easier and faster to be able to more quickly turn around and share some of that stuff with my teams. Yeah, you mentioned a couple of sort of use cases there for for recording calls sort of the the product feedback aspect the being able to know and have context on uh you know what customer what previous customer conversations have happened when you're actually going to get on the the phone for somebody for the folks who aren't recording calls today or sort of relatively you know new to it's not a practice that is happening on every call or something that's happening automatically what's your sort of take on you know alternatives or, or ways that Think, what's the sort of how would you handle the objection of like oh this is a new thing this is going to take buy-in this isn't something we're doing consistently you know what's the, the sort of argument there for doing it in as a recording versus you know another way of capturing that voice of customer yeah i mean the first the first argument is you should be doing it consistently it should happen every call 
And if you're not recording it and having support from pooling to help you do that, like someone should in theory be writing down those notes or those thoughts or capturing that feedback somewhere. Um, and if that is true, you're likely ending up in crazy spreadsheets or endless Google Docs or long email thread. I mean, we see it in, in Slack and emails and, and all that stuff is good. But accompanying that with the actual words that were used and the actual problems, and with that, you get emotion and you get sense of urgency and you get tone, right? Those are all secondary points of data to help validate that thing. So when someone is telling you they have a problem and you can physically and emotionally see they are also frustrated and they're, you can really tell that's a problem for their business. Um, that's hard to capture in notes. That's hard to reciprocate and, and repeat in a way that actually was conveyed to you. Um, so I don't know. My, my stance is it all should be captured somehow, whether you're doing that manually or in CRM notes. Sure. But make your life easier and make the people who have to digest that lives easier by actually giving them the, the clips and the real voice. And then you're what's nice with gain, for example, like it helps generate the notes for me. And I'll go in and edit stuff and tweak stuff, obviously. But it makes the starting point so much faster. So when I'm on days like this, where I have seven calls back to back to back to back, it is hard to keep up with that. It is hard to share those notes. It is hard to, same in, in sales and in marketing, right? Like, um keeping up with that is a job of itself and so having the power to automate moving some of those clips into places like slack or hubspot with the integration that grain is now um also working with on the hubspot side like has made life so much easier because even as someone who's getting handed off accounts i can go look at that deal inside of hubspot and look at the notes there or the clips there and understand what was actually said in a demo and what was actually sold and my whole thing with customer engagements is can i confirm instead of having to make them repeat so if i can come in and say i heard you say abc and i might have not heard that till literally two seconds before the call but now it makes them feel like oh sherelle actually heard me this company cares about me they took notes on this stuff um and that is as simple as listening to three one minute long clips and how i feel very informed about the conversation and i'm still going to do discovery i'm still going to unpack more stuff but i can lead with is this still true? Tell me more about this. I've heard you said ABC. Um, this makes you a much more trusted advisor and consultant for your customers, which I think is ultimately what we're all trying to build. For sure. And one thing I'm really curious about, Mike, because you mentioned sort of Graham was you know, relatively early on the um, the power of a voice of the customer and being able to use uh, you know qualitative, uh, I guess, speech data, for lack of a yeah. better term, uh, sort of to to really power things like what have you seen in terms of trends like who are the teams who uh started out using grain who are yeah. the teams who are sort of now using grain like where does where does you sort of sit in that uh you know uh landscape of uh of tooling but also you know the the things that people are actually trying to do uh with core recordings yeah good question and to to build on what sherelle is saying there's there's really two aspects of this and they're pretty distinct and one is just that like reality the like this happened, it's a recording, it's the customer, it's objective data, you don't have to take my opinion for it. And in the early days of kind of grain, we were probably a year and a half into the company, we completely threw away our product that was like a meeting notes with timestamps in it. And we're like, there's something about these timestamps. And then we realized what people really wanted was a start and end point and to pull them out of the meetings because the meetings were too big to consume on their own. And so we put that into the world right before COVID. And we started to hear people um, say, oh man, like this is crazy because all of a sudden I don't have to argue anymore. It's not my opinion anymore. <laughs> it's in fact, actually, we'll see if my screen recording works. I'm gonna go do a little nostalgia of like my first um, instance in grain where I had somebody explain this to me. I was like, oh my gosh. It's 10 times more effective for me to share a grain than for me to summarize the video. Like it is right. incredibly effective to the point where if there is two minutes of valuable user conversation, like in a video, my calculus is now, do I share a 30 second clip or do I make four grains? But I don't even consider like summarizing the two minutes. Like if I have video. So let me stop sharing. Hopefully we're able to hear that audio. Yeah. Okay. And that was that was it. And that's the kind of meta moment right now of like the first grain clip that made me realize like, holy crap, the power of these like little moments. Um, but 
there's now this new, this second thing that's forming that we're, we're reacting to and responding to the market that is more in line with what I originally started with, where it's like, yes, what we just saw was data, but it's consumed in a linear fashion. And it's almost more of a way of getting over an emotional hurdle to, to kind of get past the emotional part of our brains to reach the logical part of our brains. But the transcript text, fundamentally just the words that are transcribed, that's what large language models use. They don't use video, they don't use audio, they don't use intonation, they don't use the content on a screen. It's We can do incredibly powerful things just fundamentally based on the text output. And chat GPT is, you know, obviously moved to this revolution into the world on indexing the corpus of knowledge of mostly blog posts and websites and, you know, written, you know, text. It's rarely spoken text that becomes kind of the input of the training data and, and ultimately the, uh, um, the, the knowledge that the large language model is able to use to answer and respond to questions. And that's where this kind of like next, you know, wave of, of, power starts to come from and it doesn't take away from the beauty of the first it just makes it easy actually easier to to convey the information when text is fine to find the information when you're looking for that like really punchy moment and to ultimately automate away a lot of the busy work because large language models have have emerged as this really powerful way of doing something that you know, a bunch of interns, if you could, you know, had a budget could do. Oftentimes it's not like as brilliant, you know, as, as, as human intuition. In fact, it kind of can't be because it's just, you know, going off of the corpus of, of original thought and, and more mostly regurgitating, but it can be an extremely powerful tool um, to augment, I would say human intelligence and ultimately, um, save a bunch of time when it comes to that very human work that we do of of understanding qualitative problems and conveying information and the, the kind of hack the unlock is is let the let the customer speak for themselves and you know our what we've realized our job at grain is is to to make it easier and easier for to, to empower that to happen yeah, I'm, I'm really curious in your experience, Sherelle, at, at sort of really large orgs that have clearly have a ton of data. I mean, take booking, for example. I can't even imagine how many calls are happening you know, yeah. daily. And Mike, you started this conversation with, you know, it's data. How do you sort of start to use what you're hearing, the what is in that text output to make a case in the same way that you would with sort of any other data? Like, how do you take, you know, if, uh, if you're going to make the the case for a new feature or for, you know, handling this situation in this particular way in a playbook, like how do you start to take that data and yeah. actually turn it into something that people will pay attention to? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question. Sherelle? No, go ahead. no, you go first. Okay, I'll go first. I'll, I'll, I'll answer quickly. And this actually goes back to a question I didn't answer that you asked earlier, which was like, what were the early use cases of grain? And, and it wasn't CS and it wasn't sales. It was actually product research. Um, and part of that I think was biased by my own, like I'm trying to go from zero to one myself as a startup founder, like, and so I really wanted to hear, but that's who the early customers were. It was like the product teams at Podium um, and it was the product teams at, you know, uh, user interviews. And then, and then we realized that like a lot of other, um, it was, it kind of slowly emerged that it became kind of a de facto uh, use case for, for sales and CS. But I would say there's a commonality between the users of, say, um, using it for like product research and discovery and customer success and advocacy or sales because, you know, great um, revenue conversations, um, whether they're in a success conversation or a sales conversation, are fundamentally the same thing as a great product research conversation, which is just investigative, you know, inquiry and listening and understanding a qualitative problem. And so, um, I think about, you know, the kind of go forward future and the safety of, you know, our human jobs in this world of LLMs. And I think they're safe for a long time because like, um, you know, our ability to do that work again is augmented by te technology, but it's hard to imagine that it can really be fully replaced um, until we're like on the other side of the uncanny valley and you, you can't even tell the difference between, you know, AI agents and, and, uh, and, and real people. But um, I would say that is kind of what we've seen is it really comes down to 
this qualitative understanding of a complex problem and customers are complex and their problems are complex. And, you know, our job as, you know, revenue oriented people is to advocate on their behalf. And I think that's why there's probably been such a parallel between the like product research use case and even the sales and success use cases that we've seen with green. Totally. Yeah. I, so, I mean, all of that resonates so much because I think it's me as someone who's always been in customer onboarding and success roles and manage those teams and scale those efforts, a big, a big part of my success has come from actually understanding customers and being able to then translate those needs right. to product teams. And then, you know, really, truly playing that conduit. Um, he said something earlier, I always laugh about it because I, I'll, I'll sometimes use voice and customer data kind of passive aggressively to push my own needs through and my own asks through. And what that is data to your question, Stuart, like especially at larger organizations like booking.com when I was there or even Sprout, where you're doing hundreds of calls a month. Those are all individual yep. data points. So when my product teams, I, I worked very closely with product managers for all new features and all new releases. If they want to do any sort of research, I could just go take those specific buzzwords and have my teams talk about them or ask them. So things like, oh, that's great feedback. Now I can, to Mike's point, I can search that text string. And now I have 70 clips that start with, oh, that's great feedback or that end with, oh, that's great feedback. And I can go quickly look at that, right? So in a tangible world, if the team is trying to release a new feature, I can go get real time data on it and real time insights on it and actually hear customer feedback pretty quickly. Like if I have a team of 10 people doing five calls a day, now I have 50 sound bites throughout one single week that I can throw one day that I can turn around and share with teams. Right? So when you roll that up into a spreadsheet and now you're looking at individual data points and I can say 300 times this month, someone talked about this specific data point that they're asking for our analytics suite or this specific feature that we don't have that customers keep asking for, that's pretty damn compelling. Like someone has to listen to that. Um, that's no longer just Sherelle's opinion or Mike's opinion or Stuart's opinion. These are actual words that people are using. And now you can say, if we're thinking about prioritizing, now let's look at smaller teams, for example, like the worlds we live in. When you do have limited bandwidth and you have hundreds of features that are requested, now you can actually prioritize. All right, these ones give yeah. us the most. Here's their applications. Here's how they actually work. Um, and it's having this capability has also made, I think, me a better customer success manager when I put that hat on because I get to actually listen to what Mike just said. I can ask a question and shut up and listen and hear what the customer's saying versus worrying so about the notes or worrying so much about how I'm going to capture this or I'm going to reshare this or I'm going to go, you know. Um, so when you remove that, you can lead into a call with a set of three or four questions that you're going to ask every time. Now those are timestamps. You can search those really easily with the power of automating some of this stuff. You can auto tag it and auto clip it and all that. And what used to take hours to digest and unpack afterwards in a couple of minutes, I'm done. And I can roll that up at the end of the week. I love, um, grain has a highlights feature and a stories feature where I can compile a bunch of clips into one place. And so anytime we do a new feature launch or something like that, we'll have a story on that topic or a story on feedback or anytime we roll out a new feature, great. Let me spend a minute talking about that and just get the reaction. Um, and what's cool is like the, the voice of customers, obviously very important. And that's the, the main focus here, but it also feels really good to marketing teams when the thing they marketed worked. It feels really great for your engineering teams when they can hear a customer say, Oh, I just used that thing that you built yesterday and it actually made my job better. Or I used it and it didn't do everything I thought it would. Here's what I thought it would do. Great. Now we have like, who wouldn't want to hear that if you're an engineer, if you're a product marketer, why wouldn't you want to know how to make your life easier? Um, so all of that is how and why you should use that data. Yeah, I think that is, is so impactful. And this is definitely something I want to sort of get into here is how you use you know, you take the individual call recordings, whether it's just one person in that call and sort of share that knowledge or that insight, that context across the organization. I think that, you know, and especially in the last few years, but probably has always been true, but whoever's closest to the customer ultimately wins. Uh, and that doesn't just mean the teams that are, you know, by default close to the customer and sales and success because they're talking to customers all the time. But how do you get everybody at an org 
uh, to understand the voice of the customer, understand what's important, what are the sort of themes that are that keep coming up. Like, how, how do you think about that, or how how do you see folks using uh, tools to actually share knowledge beyond the specific initiative of you? Know, we're going to release this feature. Uh, we want this type of feedback. We have these specific questions. How do you see that playing out uh, as orgs, and especially larger orgs that you know are? Uh, it's easier to be further from the customer. Um, the bigger you get, ultimately. Um, how do you see that playing out with tools like Grain, with sort of core recording as a as a tool in the tool belt for uh, capturing voice customer? Yeah, I think there's really two things that come up from that question and what Sherelle was just saying. And one is a woman, in, uh, she's a research base, but she talks about this idea of continuous customer discovery. And just like you kind of have continuous integration or continuous deployment or continuous whatever, the customer understanding oftentimes comes in spits and waves and you'll do a research project or whatever else. And, and when the capturing the voice of the customer just becomes the default, you know, that fundamentally changes, I would say the ability of an entire team to stay close to that customer. Cause now all of a sudden have access to something that is historically like you kind of get it. A lot of times you don't want to throw, you know, on the team um, on a customer call and and, and, and especially and now suddenly you can have access to it same thing with product managers i mean one of the things that you know we just hired a new marketer and one of the things that he's been saying you know that's just fundamentally different about uh, on ramping at grain um for the product marketing work that he's doing is just the access to the corpus of every sales call every customer success call and I take it for granted often that I can just be like, oh, yeah, I talked to that user with that use case at that type of company, you know, two weeks ago, six months ago. And I can just drop in the grain and, and either pull out a clip or share the full recording. And I kind of take for granted oftentimes how powerful that can be, you know, for 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 continuous discovery and team alignment. And then I think the, the other aspect of this is, you know, it kind of goes back to you know, this advocacy or um, uh, really it's it, it in line and is there a certain line that would be more Seems like we might have some audio interruption. Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. Maybe this is a good good spot, Mike. I don't sure if the it sounds like the potentially some audio uh, challenges at the end of that last uh, little piece. Sure. Maybe let's switch to to you, and let's talk it sort of specifically about you know how we use core recordings at at Arrows. I know this is probably to Mike's. Uh, similar to, yes, I think that's a little better. Okay. Well, didn't mean to interrupt. Keep going. Um, I think that's one of the things that we probably also take for, for granted at, at Arrows is that there just sort of is this repository of uh, of recorded calls, whether they're from sales, whether they're from success, whether they're from you know discovery intent, uh, specific discovery or um, you know research uh, sessions, but. I know what we we have a few things that we do or that we have that are sort of team wide. I'm curious to sort of maybe start from from where you sit in your role and how how you sort of tactically use the recording beyond just sort of inviting the the meeting recording or the meeting recorder to uh, to Zoom. Yeah. Like, what are you actually doing with those <laughs> recordings and how do you use them sort of in your workflow? Yeah, that was, I'm gonna ramble because there's a lot of applications. Um, the obvious ones are the ones we're talking about sharing customer feed, literally taking the voice and sharing it with internal teams, with product teams as a means to share feedback internally. Um, you know, if you, if you get, this is not to point fingers at certain departments, but if this, if a certain sales rep keeps selling deals and they keep churning early on, what are they saying? What are they, what ex expectations are being misset? Like, can you uncover some of that? Um, in our actual day to day. So I, 
what after I after calls, I'll go clip them. And what's nice and grain is in real time, it gives you a little notepad while the calls are happening. So as I touch on some of those topics that I know are top of mind for me, whether that's new features, questions I have to ask, depending on the call type, obviously there's different agendas, right? So as I'm hitting my agenda points, I'm also quickly leaving myself a little note or starting to clip that in there. So then I can go back and review those clips. So I physically go watch those clips. I do a little bit of editing to make them the entire clip I wanna hear and give it a title. Um, I like using grains tags inside of highlight names because then they're easily searchable and you can filter and sort by them in future worlds. So my core things I'll use are things like quest hashtag questions or hashtag feedback or hashtag um, complaints, whatever, whatever the topics are, because then I can compile those quickly at the end of the week or end of the month or end of the quarter and say, here is all of the feedback I got on feature A this month. Um, in real time, I'll share stuff to Slack. It, either directly, I'll copy and paste the link or through um, Grain's integration with Slack, I can just say, send this to this channel and it'll send over the clip. So we have a voice of customer channel at Arrows. We also have a voice of customer fun channel. So in that core one, it's things like feedback and questions and main topics we're talking about. In the fun one, it's when people's reactions to new features or someone's dog runs across the screen or something like that, right? And it's also fun like capturing those moments because again, it's relationship building. And a month from now when we talk, I can say, oh, did Stuart, did you take your kid to the park again? Because last time we talked, you were mentioning just coming back from there. And it's little things like that that make customers feel so special and so important. Um, at the end of the week, I also put together kind of an update on what happened in onboarding, what happened in customer success, what happened in support that week. All of those are opportunities to pull in clips when they're appropriate and when they make sense. Um, between myself and our um, chief product officer, we're also doing a ton of customer research calls, both on new features we're releasing, on things we're trying to learn about, on ideas we have. So all of that gets captured and shared. So that's a lot of the like physical sharing of the voice itself. Um, the other application is I use it a lot for training, like obviously training new hires on here's a, here's a repository of information you can go learn. But also if you have individual teams you're managing, I used to keep scorecards for calls, um, which might, might be a future feature you can throw into grain because the ability to add a scorecard in there and to actually score calls. Cause then when you have new hires that are trying to develop and grow their careers, you can actually go through that scorecard and say, cool, you hit all the discovery. You touched all the main parts of this agenda that we want to touch on. Here's what you could do differently. Or, or a customer was saying this and you cut them off, for example, right? Um, one thing I am, as, as most of you who have joined these workshops probably can attest to, is I talk a lot and I can ramble and keep going on topics. So tools like Grain have actually helped me learn how to be more quiet, how to listen more. When you look at the, some of those talk times and think, oh crap, I talked for 95% of that call when it was a customer research call, that's a bad ratio. Like I'm trying to listen to what you have to say. Um, so a lot of it is also to just teach internally, teach new teams, teach yourself how to be a better advocate for customers um, on top of just that whole ecosystem of making them feel special and important and heard. Like we hear customers have endless options, especially in today's world. They can cancel tools. They can jump to anything else. Like sometimes it's feature specific. A lot of times it's how they felt how the relationship went, how the other end of that call made them feel, right? And having that having that ability to quickly be reminded who that person is, what some of their high level pains are, what some of their needs are, like just adds such a unique and personal layer in a very digitized and like tech forward world that we live in today. Yeah, I think one of the big things to to mention too, and maybe Mike, this is a good good opportunity to sort of share some of the, you know, how how it actually works, uh, sort of side of side of things. But one thing that we we do is we also pull, um, you know, pull the summaries, pull the sort of insights from calls into HubSpot, so that it, which has the advantage of like yes, things get shared in Slack. There's there's often a lot of discussion generated around uh, those clips that get shared in in Slack, but Ultimately, HubSpot is sort of the place for us, at least, and you know other CRMs, maybe a, uh, where other folks are sort of keeping as their their source of truth. But the the thing that happens there is anybody on the team can go look at that record now and find, oh, this is the you know this is the summary of the recent this recent call. This is the summary of that call, um, which of course makes it much much easier when you have you know handoffs that happen. Obviously, sales to success is a 
is a common one or pretty much every customer is going to have a, uh, a handoff of, of sorts. And, and the way that you sort of manage that handoff uh, is made much easier by being able to centralize everything in one place. You, everybody has context on what the customer is trying to achieve, what is being said. Um, to Sherelle's point, you know, if you can use it on the sort of more negative or uh, sort of learning side of, you know, if this is a customer who is struggling or is, uh, has churned, you can go back and look at what was their experience prior and sort of avoid that. But also, you know, in the, uh, the case where you are kicking off with a new customer, how do you take what they said in discovery during the sales cycle and not have to re-ask that question? How can you just confirm, uh, like Cheryl said earlier, uh, you know, the things that they've already said? Uh, rather than having to repeat themselves. So I'm, maybe Mike, uh, let me know if, if you want me to, to share this, but sort of how does that actually work? Like, how do you move that data around? How do you go from, uh, or how does Grain help you go from big block of text in a you know, full recording transcript uh, or full you know, length recording and transcript to the things that actually end up in a sort of use, useful in, uh, in the CRM? You are muted, Mike. I can also go ahead and, and share how this works. Happy to do that. Um, looks like we lost Mike. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and and share my screen here. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, sort of at the the very top of this call. Um, we have these these templates that you can go ahead and, and sort of use and implement yourself. There's uh, a couple of different ones here. This is the the one for getting uh, summaries uh, from your call recordings in in Grain into HubSpot. Uh, there's also a couple for for sharing product feedback or sharing uh, summaries in in Slack as well. But uh, essentially, how this uh, one works is so you need a a Grain account, um, and then in your uh, preferences. You can, you know, make sure that you're you're setting to record uh, the meetings you have. Connect your HubSpot account, um, and then this is the the bit that's most interesting. And maybe Mike, you can speak to sort of why things are laid out this way, like how this how this sort of came about. Um, but the thing that actually ends up in uh, in the HubSpot timeline for uh, for a customer is this sort of AI generated summary uh, with the key points with timestamps. Um, and the, you know, everything in the context of the record that already exists in HubSpot, whether that's a, a contact or a, or a deal. Um, Mike, you mentioned- We're going to try my uh, iPhone microphone. Does this work? <laughs> this is, this is great actually. Oh my gosh. Because it wouldn't let me unmute. It was so bizarre. It was like, anyway, seemingly connected. Sorry for all the audio issues. I, I've never had anything like this before, but no, this is this is great. I, I can actually share um, my screen as well and walk through a, a couple of these things and these workflows. But this is something we've released um, recently. But um, if we look at, say, for example, I'll just uh, look at my whole um, screen here. So are we seeing my whole screen? Um, there we go. Oh, wow. So now we're in uh, the infinite depths. So like this is a call I had with um, with Daniel. I was actually just trying to get his help and support on our HubSpot launch. And um, so then this is Daniel's record here in HubSpot. And what we were launching is this ability to take like an AI output. So historically in Grain, you'd have to kind of go through and create highlights and add your own comments. But now we have like AI that adds comments to whatever content is in a part of the transcript or the recording. And it creates a highlight. So contact on arrows won't plan don't plan don't update HubSpot deal manually add. So um, some some are better than others. But in a in a new world of like large language model first world, um, these AI outputs are I would say kind of like leading the show because they're completely automated. And so this is like the short TLDR. Here's the key points with timestamps. And in this case, there weren't any next steps identified. But with the grain HubSpot. Um, integration that um, Cheryl was uh, referring to is this automatically gets posted into as a note in and it matches with Daniel's um, email address in HubSpot. So we actually had a, a, a prep meeting for this um, this uh, workshop yesterday and I didn't realize Grain had automatically because 
um, Daniel was on this, he had automatically added the AI summary of that meeting as well. So it kind of takes you out of a world where you have to um, manually remember to spend all that time after the meeting is over to do that work and just go, you know, replace that time with the other, you know, more important work that you have to do instead of trying to make sure that your, your meetings are perfect. And then the added benefit of that is not only is it generally pretty, pretty accurate, it's all powered by GPT 3.5. Um, it also, in one of the core philosophical things of grain is that large language models and AI has a tendency to hallucinate. And so sometimes it's not perfect. Sometimes it's not accurate. And so with grain, everything is always time stamped. And so you can always go back to that source of truth into that moment. Um, if something seems a little off or a little weird and, you know, for this other thread that we were talking about earlier in terms of like, that is awesome. I discovered that inside of HubSpot in a call I wasn't even a part of, I want to now kind of pull out the 30 seconds around that and add that to, you know, my case I'm making for this feature or, you know, another example of this bug that appeared or, you know, this pattern that I'm seeing, you know, with the type of buyer that we're experiencing. And it just democratizes access to all of that content because it's not just the person who was in it. It's now kind of spread into the tools where it belongs. And we're focused increasingly over the next six months on making those outputs that and, and the workflows, because there's you can also send it to Slack or send it wherever else, getting it into the format that is as close to what you would have written up and making that customizable and templatizable based on the, the use case. Because a quarterly board review is a very different output than a you know check-in call or a handoff call or whatever else it may be. And so um, you know, the real upshot is that as AI gets better and better at being kind of, you know, an army of interns for each of us, you know, we can spend more time, you know, doing the the differentiated work that we can do and, and not the busy work that a computer can do. Yeah, I think the thing that's really interesting, and we've seen this in sort of other applications or other uh, other integrations, and you know, the arrows is an example of this, other integrations with uh, we can talk about HubSpot specifically, but more broadly, you know, the place where all of your other data about customers lives is you can do really interesting segmentation things. You can do really interesting, you're sort of enriching the data set that you already have, right? You can now say, okay, this is the type of things that this customer is saying on calls and they happen to ha be in this industry at this revenue, you know, level at this, they bought this product and start to make much more, you sort of have a, a much more real time sort of picture or more complete real time picture um, of everything that's going on versus having to go out and you know pull all that into a BI tool or pull all that into lots of other different places, which ultimately sort of democratizes access to that uh, that insight and you have more people across the team who are able to you know draw conclusions, come up with ideas based on that uh, that insight um, and ultimately push things forward. I'm curious, Sherelle, what's something that and I can speak from the marketing side maybe, but what, what's something that you've sort of a, a direct application or something that is, uh, has happened as a result of having uh, you know, live voice of the customer data that maybe would have gone a different way in a different, in a, in a previous world or you know, didn't go the way that you expected to go, but was helped by, uh, by having the data from, from customer calls. Yeah, this is gonna sound like a brag, uh, maybe it's a humble brag, um, but I tend to get the things I want built or prioritized, built and prioritized because of actually sharing the customer data. Like, and it feels meta because my background is all in customer onboarding and lifecycle retention and, and those plays and Arrows is a tool that does that. So I actually also use our product in my day job, um, which feels very crazy to me at times. So when I'm also trying to like prioritize things and get features built, there is a layer of selfishness and a layer of bias within some of that because I'm also using the product daily. And so it's done two things. It's one helped me actually get things built quickly and more effectively and prioritized. But I think more importantly, it has helped me come out of a lot of that bias and realize that there are a lot of times where I might think about something, but it's because of my bias and because of my day-to-day -day application of it. Whereas customers turn around and actually say, oh, we want it this way, or we want it a little bit different than how you may have described it or how you may have led with it. Um, 
And I think what it's made, and I, I said this earlier, like the bridge between customer success and product management can actually get pretty powerful when you do think about it a little bit differently and listen to the voice and listen to the customer and all that. Um, so it, I think it has helped me become a better partner to our product teams and to our engineering teams to actually take that thing that the customer is saying and being able to translate it and share it. And we've talked a lot about the sound clips and, and the transcripts, and obviously that's huge, right? A, another big component to Grain is recording the actual video and the screen sharing. So now I can get a customer to show their application or show what they're doing or show what they're going through whether that's in a product or not, show me your process, walk me through it, and then talk me through that while you're doing it. And I can really turn around and say, here's what they're showing. Here's a bug, for example. I wasn't able to replicate it, but they show it three times happening here in real time. Um, so what that rolls up to is our team is being able to more quickly resolve stuff for our customers, whether that's new features, whether that's bugs, whether that's um, you know whatever it is we're working on. And for me as a partner, for my teams as partners to the product teams and to the marketing teams, we are better stewards of that information because we can speak the lingo now. We can actually see and share things that are happening. Um, I think it, I'm, I'm, you know, the steward, I'm very big on feedback and feedback loops and making sure that everyone internally is working from a cohesive unit. And I think this this takes out any sort of argument or internal bias you might have because it's like, here is what customers are saying. We should all rally around this together collectively and try to figure it out. And if you're doing that, you are truly building a business and building an org that is serving customers and not just your own needs or your own metrics or your own KPIs. Yeah, I think it, it really does help. And obviously we're a pretty small org, so you don't have the same challenges that you know a hundred or thousand person company does when it comes to sort of uh, internal politics and and you know, right. uh, the loudest voice in the room getting what they want, uh, you know, done. But I, I do really think that the having the voice of the customer and being able to, you know, start from the everybody have the same starting point is a really disarming, uh, you know, thing when it comes to those internal discussions. It's it's the team against the problem totally. that, rather than against right. oh, this is the person's idea. Let's try to discredit that idea or like make sure that my idea is better than their or right. whatever it is. Like it is now the the customer is the, the starting point. Right, because it's no longer Mike's opinion now. And maybe that is Mike's opinion as well, but it's Mike sharing a clip from a customer who's saying that opinion, right? And that hopefully breaks down some of those internal politics, especially as you get into larger organizations where, you know, you, <laughs> you said the loudest voice in the room, you know, that comment is always true and you know, it always comes up, but the loudest voice in the room should be your customers and it's your job to amplify it. And it's tools like Grain that actually help you amplify that voice. So if I'm the loudest voice in the room because I'm screaming at what customers are saying, great, you should probably all be listening to that loudest voice in the room because it's not Sherelle, the person, it's actually just a conduit to what our customers are saying and sharing. Really well said. Yeah, you can always turn up the volume on the Grain clips. Right, um, exactly. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious if there's anybody uh, you know joining us live who has questions. If there's anything that folks want to you know dive deeper deeper into, Mike, what what's been the I guess same similar question to Sherelle, well. Like, what's been the most surprising thing that obviously you have a different experience, but also building the tool that and using the tool um, for for cool recording. What's been the most surprising or the I know you shared a great clip. Uh, earlier, like what, what's been something that you've seen or has been a surprise to you in clips that you've seen from either your own team or, uh, you know, folks using Gray? I mean, we've, we've had Gray used for a lot of very interesting use cases I never would have imagined. Um, that's one of the things about being a fairly like horizontal, you know, universal product. Um, and usually the like most strange use cases involve some sort of like uploading a video where it's just like kind of viewing it grain is a more like a text based video editor more so than like a conversation, you know, work analyzer, workflow builder, you know, video snippeter. And so, um, but you know, the thing that I think has been really interesting and so there's a bit of a meta story here is like I mentioned, I, I kind of thought our, 
our customer success was actually the first use case that came to mind when we had the first version of Gray in like 2019. And it was like basically a Google Doc that added timestamps to the moments when you typed a note in the document. And customer success really liked it. And then we created a version um, that had the highlight clips and, and then products started screaming about how much they loved it. And so then that kind of diverted our, our, our attention and effort to really focusing on the product use case and, and the research use case. And, you know, as we were re evaluating, you know, we ran a research project pro process at the beginning of the year where we said, let's look at the top 40 accounts and let's deeply understand them qualitatively in a way that's very difficult to understand quantitatively because we can see how much these accounts are using it, how much they're paying us, how many users they have, um, how many highlights they're making, how many stores they're creating. But we don't know exactly, you know, who each of these people are and, and, and what they benefit from. So we kicked off a research project and talked to our top 40, you know, accounts and and a really surprising thing emerged from that, which was actually that the majority of our kind of power users and the most common pattern of land and expand of grain was not actually product. It was sales and customer success. Um, it was it was a more of a, a recognition that, you know, existing really expensive conversation intelligence tools are way overbuilt and they're way more than is really needed and grain provided the um i would say enough of what they wanted without any of the extras and what was crazy is it was like well, well we don't even have a crm integration yet like because we've been focusing on this other use case and yet against our awareness you know this the the, the sales and cs use case had kind of emerged despite our flaws and our lack of focusing on it as as I would say, the power use case. And so once we did that, it fundamentally changed our roadmap. It fundamentally changed our, you know, definition of our ICP and our focus on marketing. And, you know, um, and, and we've seen the benefits that come from that. But these qualitative problems are freaking messy. They're sticky. They're hard. And, and they, a lot of times they take time. And, you know, I wish I could go into detail of how some of the stuff we have on the roadmap around, like, making a collection of like conversations and asking a GPT style question against just that set of transcript data for those 12 related meetings and getting a synthesized, you know, answer across that, you know, GP chat GPT style, like that's the type of stuff that's coming down the road and gets me even more excited about the power that comes with, um, you know, tools in this category that, uh, can help us to understand these really messy qual qualitative problems that you can't really see in your amplitude dashboards. Yeah, for sure, and, and I think that's going to be a super exciting, uh, you know, time to to be trying to solve these problems. Right, it's to your point about the amplitude dashboard. It's going to be both much more or much easier to go in and get the data that you're looking for and and get a, a get a get an answer or a, you know a direction across a, a much broader data set than you you would have previously, but um, but also just giving more people access to be able to go do that rather than have to go figure out a, a complicated product analytics tool or a BI tool. Um, totally. And building on something Sherelle said earlier is like historically in grain, you've had to have a taxonomy of topics that you care about and you tag the moments and it's awesome because now all of a sudden you have the data and it's better than the alternative of nothing. We're searching through, you know, eons of, of transcript data to find keywords and thinking about the power that comes from tra topic trackers um, that happen in an automated fashion, you know, we're starting to do that work, but you know, what we've done so far compared to what's on the roadmap is, is pretty, you know, differentiating. And so now you have this kind of like push versus pull or discovery versus inquiry type of operation. And sometimes you use one and sometimes you use the other. And so one is more organic where you're like, these are the topics I care about. Tell me about them when they appear. And the other is like, what's the answer to this specific question across this like corpus of, of customer data? And I guess to just anchor lastly on how we see things, you know, evolving in this market is, is, is 2013 is 2008. It's crazy. It's it 2008 is when mobile showed up and it changed the world and it took five plus years until you really started to see the applications of having a computer and the internet you know, in your pocket as bandwidth improved, et cetera. But that's the last time, and I, I, I don't mean to offend any blockchain-y, you know, crypto people in here, but I've never been, you know, a super 
uh, I've never really just bought it. I've never really been into it. And and I and I think that you know the price of Bitcoin has gone up, but the other applications are you know more questionable. And I think that that you know is trying to be pushed as like a Web three, et cetera, et cetera. But I. I I personally think that came and went and I don't think we're coming back and I might get like destroyed on Twitter um, by crypto people. But I will go on record in saying that large language models are actually that next revolution. It is truly insane what you now can do and the applications of it. We're in like the top of the first inning of what's possible as a result of of being able to quickly and accurately um leverage you know structured text-based information and where tools like grain come in is it's not indexed off the corpus of the internet it's indexed off the corpus of your customer whether you spoke to them or the product people spoke to them or the sales people spoke to them it doesn't really matter and 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 yes it's not the structured research you know unbiased you know answer to a question that like a researcher would do but it's pretty dang good in terms of it being just the raw truth of what the customer is saying. And so that's, um, you know, I think the, the thing that gets me the most excited as I look at, you know, our roadmap and I just look at the broader market and, and the underlying technical change that's driving, you know, what's possible. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty invigorating. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Any last words for you, from, uh, from you on, you know, how you, how you think that this will continue to, you know, change the the workflow, change the day to day of individual CSMs of the folks who are actually talking to customers. Like, what's the next thing that you're looking at? Is like, oh, that's that's going to help me in my my role, of folks on my teams. Yeah, a lot of the stuff Mike is talking about and is already built, and even like automated keyword trackers or whatever we call them. Um, all of this, I feel like just makes it easier to have normal human connection on these phone calls and worry less about the notes and the follow up and the stuff that all the stuff that in the day job that no one really loves to do, but you have to do to, to do your job well. Um, as someone who loves conversating with customers and candidly hates the part of doing follow ups and notes and you know all that stuff. Um, this makes it enjoyable because it does the job for me. It helps me be better at my job. It helps my teams be better at their jobs. And so it allows us to actually build connections and relationships with folks, which is I think what most of us are after and allows us to use technology and tooling in a way that helps make those jobs better. I, I think about the same as arrows as I do with the grain. Neither of them are going to replace human beings it just makes human beings so much more effective at their at their core jobs and their core functionalities um, with accuracy too. Like that's the other part that I think is easy to overlook. This is accurate. It is not just data points, but it's accurate data because it's real conversation. It's the words that are coming out of people's mouths. It's the feedback that is usually someone in some room that is so far disconnected from that actual conversation trying to draw a conclusion on or a hypothesis on. And it changes that and it shortens that gap, hopefully, between what customers are saying and needing and those product cycles that then turn around and build those things. Um, and if you do enough of that, like small incremental learning and, and repetition, you're just building a better customer environment, a better customer experience. And that's the part that I look forward to is people like me being able to do those parts of their job that they love while helping everyone around them internally be better, helping those customers be better um that's that's kind of the euphoria i'm after in my job at least what a great Very place well to, said again yeah what a place to leave it well we are at at time here mike i want to thank you so much for for joining us this was, was a pleasure. Awesome. thank you guys uh, yeah of course and for everybody who is who is watching who's watching the recording down the, the line of this which we will send out uh afterwards where should they go to you know learn more about grain and, and sort of start uh, implementing some of the things that we've talked about today. Yeah, it's just it's just grain.co and um you know one of the things I'm focused on over the next you know couple months is just matching your use case and getting you the templates and the workflows um as as you sign up. But I would say between now and then the workflows, the templates that are out there on in the arrows vault is actually as good or better than anything we you know have internally at grain. So uh, this is probably be a great starting point. Awesome. Yeah. So for, for those who, who want to go get those templates, arrows.to slash vault. 
um, and we have all of those uh, those there. I'm sure we'll be adding more. We can certainly have more for, for specific use cases as well. But thank you so much to everybody for, for joining us. Thank you to uh, Mike. Thank you to Sherelle. Uh, as always, uh, we'll send you all the recording. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great week.